when people talk about this operation of God, it is not to make you into some freak that's, you know, some person that you'd say, oh, that, that's a wacky religious person. It is establishing something that God said, you're mine, you belong to me. And let me ask it this way. How many of you can say unequivocally 100%, so I'm, I'm saying if you are on the yes side of this, you can raise your hand. How many would say that they completely understand the word being used in the Bible, sanctification? Any, anybody want to raise their hand and say, you completely understand it? Okay then. So, and so my viewing audience, and we didn't put any cameras on you, my viewing audience can know that no, not one hand went up in the sanctuary. And that doesn't mean that we're a bunch of dummies. It just means that it's a difficult word, and this requires a little bit of digging. And I, I'm telling you in advance, I may not get to the core of what I'm trying to do in one message. Taking some of these very complicated subjects and trying to sift them down, sometimes you've got to go at it several times, and this is actually a very complicated word and subject. Sanctification came into our English language around 1520. And that's very important because it, it tells me that prior to that word coming into the language stream and its related words, sacred, I've got them down here, sacred and sanctify. Sanctify, saint and sacred come into our language about the 14th century. But why is this important? because as you start to try and figure out what this word means, you've almost got to go back and figure out, was there another word being used before the Latin got dumped in to our frame? So first, let's look at something. Um, the Latin uh, grouping of words, we'll, we'll put sank and sank, which could have the ending sanctus, we can go through a whole litany of words that are from the Latin stream, as I've said. Next, from the same grouping of words, by the way, we get our words sacrifice, sacerdotal, sacrilege, etc. We don't really have a problem until you encounter the words holy, holiness, and hallowed. And the reason for that being a problem is because when you look at the Greek, um, and I'm going to actually go back to the Hebrew first, but when you look at the Greek, you're going to find that the translators used um, sanctified, sanctification, sacred, holy, holiness, even the words set apart, all to translate, all except I think for two or three examples, to translate the Greek word hagios and its related words, hagios which means that we, A, would have to determine what hagios actually means, and in order to do that, you've got to go into the Hebrew, and you've got to see how two language streams, and I'm, it should be holy with a Y, but you're going to see that the word first comes to us as H-O-L-I, um, and many of its derivatives, which will, if I were to trace down the English going backwards, I will come up with the word hal, halig, and so forth. These are from the stream of Old Norse. So you can see two, two separate streams flowing into the language, and we managed to keep both of them, and it really messes us up. Why? Because from the Hebrew perspective, you're looking at primarily, it's not universal, but primarily, you're looking at the word Kadesh or Kadosh. And there are other, a few other Hebrew words that may be used. When you come into the Greek, you've got the word Hagios. And what happens in our language frame, and this is what I want to bring you along with to try and figure this out, 
When people talk about holy, and here's my big roadblock, there are passages in the Bible that make it absolutely impossible to make the words holy, holiness, uh, any word for sanctify or sacred, and put them all together and say they carry one meaning. Why? Because, for example, there is, uh, out of Peter's writing, he says, be ye holy, or sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ in your hearts. If we understand what the word means, and we have a meaning to begin with, what will happen is as we approach the, the various texts, we will see two things. One, that holiness cannot carry with it this definition which has become almost universal, somehow morally pure or sinless. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard me joke about this. You've heard Dr. Scott joke about this. I'm sure you've heard people say, I haven't sinned since I was saved or since I was sanctified. The Bible says, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, right? And I put emphasis just like that. I wanted to say it more colloquially, but it's family time. So we'll save the explicatives on the description of the liar. So um, <laughs> what we have is the need to, as I said, properly define the word. Now, let me, before we get into the Hebrew, let me go and do a, several steps here, which are going to look a little bit confusing. But let's, let's go back to this halig and hal, because I haven't defined what these actually meant in their original use. And these halig and hal will develop into holly, and we will have um, a little bit of a shift. But these words come to mean in our modern frame, whole, sound, health, um, the, the sense of completeness, entirety or completeness. So it's important to see from the English as it develops, and it carries with it something very interesting. These words, um, holy, They had, they actually carried with them, when they were being used in the language, they had W's in front of them. The W disappeared, and the only place in our English language where the W and H remained are in words like whole. There are other words, but um, to give you an example, that a lot of the W's were dropped off to leave the H alone, and we come up with this word. So if the word holy or hal or halig carries with it health, wholeness, soundness, if that's what it carries with it. And by the way, this particular word, we have good reference, this dating back to about 900 AD in terms of use, versus all of these sanc and sanctus um, words that came into being used, as I said, sometime between the 14th and 15th century, you definitely have to see that words were being replaced as more people, more scholars, undertook the task of translation and before the King James. We have almost a battle for what word to use. And because the terminology, the meanings of the words have not been adequately and properly defined, you get a lot of confusion. So people use the word, for example, consecrate. And it has that sacra. So this sanct and sacra, these words actually take you off in another direction. So let's talk about first these, we'll call them what they actually are. They are Old English and some of the roots that come to us from Proto Indo-European. What I've, you've seen me sometimes write pi, P-I-E, which we can basically trace all of the streams into our language from the Proto-Indo-European roots. So this is what I wanted to share with you because it, it does help um, when you start seeing some, some interesting 
uh, we'll call them signposts to, to, to better understand what's happening here. So under the first root, let me take a new page, DHE or DHO. And you might think, well, what does this have to do? This, 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 these are the, the genesis, if you will. This is the genesis of the development of our language. So you go back far enough, this de or do, to set down, to make or to shape. By the way, I'm reading from the Origins of English Words, a discursive dictionary of Indo-European roots. Joseph T. Shipley, if you're interested. Um, all right, so to set down, to make, to shape. Um, they have here from, we get our Greek word, themos, god of justice and law, thesis and so forth. But if you keep looking through this word, strangely enough, these words will take you to this word, which is do. And from this word, although I don't see the connection, I'm sure you will though, because I picked it apart, it's strangely done, halidom. Halidom carries with it the meaning of kingdom, hali, holy, dom. Um, and we've got a lot of words that kind of keep around that. So this halidom, think about our English word, words like holiday, they have their origins in this particular word grouping. There's another word grouping that, believe it or not, there's actually three word groupings. Um, the other one is Kalo. And somebody might be saying, why do I care about this Proto-Indo-European stuff? Because it's showing you how impossible it is to make this a, an absolute crystal perfect in the sense of now we've put this into a box and we've got it contained. It's not possible. Especially when, you, when we get to look at the um, Hebrew, which tends to be more ambiguous and vague. So, back to my roots here. Um, Kalo, we have here of good omen, but it's related to my group of words in this way. And I gotta read this to you. Kalo, of good omen, unharmed, well, a soul freed from matter, in the faith of the Jains, whose priest officiate entirely free from clothing. Okay, Norse, Norse and Old Norse, you've got the words Helga, you've got the words Olga. These words are actually, they're actually related back to our whole word. So don't think that this is um, a kind of sidebar. Under this heading, whole, wholesome, in the 15th century, W was added to many words beginning with H, but by 1600 had been dropped from almost all but who and whole and their compounds. And of course, we have here the words heal, healthy, and hail um, that all kind of come to this grouping. So you can see if we were to take the word holy and trace it back, we're actually coming into the sense of something that is whole and complete something that is well, that is sound, that is healthy. And keep in mind when we talk about holiness, holiness unto the Lord, it is distinguishing between that which is set apart versus that which is profane, which is not set apart. When we use the word profane, it sounds like dirty or something, but I'm using the sense of what has been separated versus what has not been separated or what has been marked off as, as opposed to the rest of everything. So there, there at least is one more uh, root in this grouping. If you're interested, um, the word, I'll write it down, these are all roots, is bout. And this um, goes into the Latin confute, refutation. Um, as you kind of whittle down this, you've got Men used to swear by, by my halidom, sometimes um, by my halidame, by my holy lady. So you can see that this hali has an interesting 
complete wholeness sense to it. Right now, I want us to look at the um, Hebrew and the Hebrew word Kadesh or Kadosh, Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, volume 12, and this is on page 522, and it has the etymology of the word. It would look like this, or let's just put it like that. Um, in the Old Testament, Kadosh, holy, um, there, what it says here is because they are, the word is based on universal human experience, um, we have the phenomenon of religion. It says it has its own way of showing that the sacred and religious life are the opposite of the profane and secular life. One of these scholars, Van der Leeuwen, or Lu, defines the holy or sacred as what has been placed within boundaries, the exceptional Latin sanctus. Whoever is confronted with potency clearly realizes that he is in the presence of some quality which cannot be evoked from something else, but which is determined by what is called, being called sacred or uh, set apart. The term or the sense holy is something totally different from what we think. It implies a qualitative distinction between the divine on one hand and human beings and the world on the other. I wish we could get away from the idea that somehow, as I've heard people describe and try and teach on this word, that this is something that we do. Now, we'll look at a few of the passages where it might be implied that way, but we know just from studying the Old Testament, there are certain concepts that immediately crystallize what this might mean as we kind of pick through the scriptures. Uh, I will give you an example of the word that I'm looking at, uh, our Latin word, if you will, um, for a sanctify in, in the creation, in Genesis 2, if you want to turn there. In Genesis 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, the seventh day God ended his work which, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now, let's talk about this. Sanct he sanctified it. He set it apart. Something that at a later time to Moses, he will say and keep my Sabbath. It is holy. But this is important because this first use gives a clue, and we're looking at the Hebrew word, Kadesh, to um, make clear that it is, it is indeed a setting apart. God set it apart for himself. And as we encounter this word, you'll find many uses that help make even clearer. Moses is in the desert. He sees this spectacle of a bush that is burning but not consumed. The voice of God speaks to him and says, Moses, come here. And he tells him, take off your shoes. The ground on which you're standing is hallowed or sacred. We've got the same Hebrew word being used. And you can see from that example, just as this is God saying, this is what I've marked off. This place where my presence is. This is where we begin to kind of understand the Hebrew frame of reference. Where my presence is, God speaking, is holy. And it is, let's distinguish it between where God is and his presence is versus where God is not. Now, if you're going to try and follow me in what I'm trying to do, it's necessary, as I said, it's not a one-size-fits-all. But as you begin to kind of mine the scriptures, I just use the Moses as an example. But even when God gives the directive for the tabernacle, and he says, Moses, see to it that you build it according to all the things that I showed you on the mount. And in that building program was not only the exact measurements and the exact everything that God said, how many loops and how many boards and 
what type of material, but the vessels that were made for the tabernacle. They were holy. Now, forgive me, but I have to do this. They were previously not holy. The vessels may have previously been, as we know, when the children of Israel left Egypt, it was taking a lot of the Egyptians' riches as they went. They came out richer. That means livestock and children. Those were the two things that God blessed them with. But they came out with a lot of stuff. So the stuff that they took from the Egyptians would have been technically profane. It would have been not seen as holy. But the minute God said, make this out of this material and those um, utensils and those tools for the tabernacle were made, they became holy. And then you read about those who were allowed to handle the holy instruments and the holy vessels, including all the way into the one individual once a year going into the Holy of Holies, who had to, um, using the word again, and it's a very strange way to use it, but he had to cleanse himself, purify himself. And we begin to see now that anything that will be set apart will be set apart first by the order of God and second set apart in a sealing of some way in a covenant with blood. When God gave the instructions to Moses, another place we read that Moses sprinkled essentially everything that was with blood. So when God said, this is mine and this is mine, including the people are mine, what did he say? You're set apart people, a chosen people. Now being set apart, let's distinguish between animate and inanimate. The things that are chosen that are inanimate, they do not have a choice. God says, that over there, that's mine, and he, he's specific, he doesn't, he's not that generic, he says that cord over there is mine, that becomes holy. But if we were going to kind of take this to the fullest example and understanding, when it comes to people, there's a different dynamic. The thing that God chooses that is inanimate, it will not, it doesn't have a voice to say, no, we do. So even when God chose people, to do his holy task, those set-apart tasks that we'll call them now, the priesthood set apart for this specific calling. It did not guarantee that these people, these individuals, would be sinless or not sin. And that we know for a fact. All you've got to do is look at the sons of Eli, and the Bible tells us that the sons of Eli were pretty wicked and corrupt, and yet God let them function doing that holy duty for a time. There are other priests just like that, and we can catalog those people who were set apart for God's use, but they still fell into temptation. They still sinned. So let's kind of throw one idea completely in the garbage. And that is somehow that when something is dedicated or set apart, although the basic meaning is set apart for the exclusive use of the deity, but when we come to animate, the things that have a voice, that have a mind, that have free will, we can still turn around and say no, or we can still turn around and corrupt it or pervert it, which we know that happens all the time. So when we use the term holiness or um, sanctify or even consecrate, we cannot maintain the definition that has been given by many scholars, we cannot maintain that this idea means somehow that you will be sinless or that you will be less sinful or that somehow you will not sin at all because these are the definitions that have been shoved down the throats of people in the church by perfectionist legalists who absolutely refuse to look at what I'm just doing now, which is piece by piece showing you when God said, hey, you, and let's now talk about somebody who wasn't even born yet. God spoke right into the womb 
where Jeremiah was being carried, right? And essentially, God is saying that one. Or how about the two children in the womb? Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Is that not God's ability to, uh, we'll say, set apart from the get-go before people are even in, in the world? And that's what, when we say your name was spoken or called before the foundations of the world were formed. There is our understanding that that setting apart is not and should never be considered as um, a homogenized somehow that leads to a life of sinlessness. That is not possible. Number two, if we're going to talk about the, the, the word sanctification and to sanctify, Paul says it in such a clear way that the complete the completion of our setting apartness will not happen here. May the God of peace wholly sanctify you over there, not here. So anybody who uses that as I've been set apart and I'm complete in the now doesn't understand the theological implications of such an idea which suggests that we're able to be perfect in the here and now. We know we're not. So this is why I said to you, it's a very complex subject. And the, the pos the, probably the impossibility of tackling, um, just, I'm just laying the foundation now. It's challenging because once you get into reading, you find out, for example, in John 17, Jesus is, that's his high priestly prayer. And in there he says, Father, sanctify them in thy word, thy word is, or in thy truth, thy word is truth. And remember, he's praying regarding, there are two groups of people being mentioned in John 17, his disciples, and there are others, others being referred to, which many people have said, who are the others? I don't know. But all I know is that he's, he's asking something of God in his prayer for people who are already following him. So let's kind of take some steps here. Let's not confuse justification with sanctification. Justification is, we'll call it the, the salvific or the, the saving portion of God's activity, where for my faith, just like Abraham, it says of him, God imputed to him his righteousness for Abraham's faith. He counted it to him as if making Abraham just like as if, as if, I hate to do this because it's the simplest definition and it's really not right for me to do this, but to, to make sure that we all understand, as if I had never sinned, as if I am being put in right standing or as one brilliant uh, word inventor, uh, our righteousification or being righteousified, being put in right standing with God for my faith never works, we are saved by faith, and that is that mechanism that starts the process. What people tend to do is they say, well, sanctification is then the process of growth after one has been justified. I know, these are like terms where you just go, oh, gosh. Can you, can you say another word? Because that word's giving me a headache. But the reality is that the understanding of sanctification or being set apart in the original intent first and foremost must not be a process. Let's go back to the inanimate for a minute. The inanimate, the vessels. Oh, if you want to say that there was a process, yes, the children of Israel uh, stole all the stuff God said, take it, it's yours, and they took it when they left Egypt, and they went out, and they had lots of stuff with them. So in that sense, if you want to say that there was a process, yes, and then they had it, and they, when God said, build this thing for me, they could have said, I'm not, I'm not going to give up my stuff. I want to keep it. I'm a hoarder, right? I like my garbage. But instead, they committed it to the Lord, so that which was inanimate. You could say, yes, there was a process of sorts. It was in the world and it became something that God claimed. And by the way, before it was in the world, it was something that God had anyway. But 
sorry, that was rhetoric, but that's the truth. And so what, what we end up with is there is no process per se in the selection of saying, that is mine, okay? Like the tree in the garden, God said, Adam, you can have everything else but that one tree, it's mine. You can say that that tree essentially was set apart, although the word is not used there, but it was set apart, and God didn't say, this is the process now for the setting apart. We're going to, like uh, the Jesus seminar, we're going to use some marbles and we're going to decide and you know, play a little game here and whatever marbles are left, that's what we'll be left with and that's how we'll make our decision. That's not the way God does it. God says, that tree, that one right over there, those vessels, that's what I want. And then now here comes you and me and here comes the trouble, right? So in the initial process, there is one act of God. That one act of God is the beginning. Let's not, con let's not con uh, confuse that with prevenient grace. Prevenient grace, God is out there before you and I are even paying attention to God, reading, knowing anything. God says, that one, I want that one. And I'm sure the angels are going, you want that one? <laughs> you know how messed up that one is? Yeah, I want that one. That, that looks like a good one. And, you know, God's got good vision, right? <laughs> He's got those extra thick glasses on. But um, it's not, the selection is not a process. Once an individual has been set apart, this is where everything goes into the garbage pail after this. People then think, because I'm set apart, now... I don't breathe, I don't, I don't, you know, here's my list because now I've been set apart. It doesn't even work like that. Take a look in your, in your own time, take a look at all the people that God called as essentially set apart, even though he didn't say this one set apart, but set apart, the only one that didn't mess up by some degree, uh, Jesus, and we might put Joseph in that category. But the rest of the people... You can say that they were called, they were chosen. Let's look at the disciples. Disciples are fishing. He says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me, I'll make you something you're not. In the moment that they listened to the voice and followed Jesus, not really, probably they heard of him, but not knowing, and begin to follow him and follow the line of thinking, because these all, they all messed up. I mean, the, the greatest mess up is Peter, and it's foretold of Peter that he's going to deny Jesus. Now, if the process of sanctification and justification happen simultaneously, then that means, according to the, the way people have defined this, it means that once Peter was chosen by Jesus, follow me, he can never mess up. Now, you, I'm, I'm looking shocked because I'm, I don't see anybody here looking shocked. That's the idea that people have peddled as good and solid theology, and it's not, because the reality is, yes, there is a process of growing. I've referred to it as growing grace. There's a process of growing. And that process must be understood as, we'll call them the trials that, that help us along. They're not the trials that hinder us eyes of faith say the trial, I welcome the opportunity that my disability or my inability will bring for God to do what I am not able to do. There is my opportunity of faith. So when we look at this subject, it, it's very important to understand if we're going to use the English frame from the Old English we might get a sense that when people were translating the sense of, of holy, we might do well in some cases to understand as the wholeness that was originally with Adam before the fall, the wholeness of man before sin took root and altered the blueprint of humanity, and that wholeness represents when God essentially looking at me because I've looked to Jesus. The faith that I'm looking towards is what Jesus has accomplished. I'm, 
I'm looking at that. I see the blood. God sees that the blood has been applied to my heart. He's looking at me as though I am just like Jesus. That is the, the justification portion. What is being labeled as holiness, that we cannot sin or whatever, which is a bunch of skabala, the reality is it's set apartness for God, but I'm still living in this container and I still have my identity. The idea somehow, somehow that holiness represents you being locked away in some monastery somewhere. I don't call that holiness, I call that insanity. But uh, you didn't ask me for that, so I won't share that with you. Um, although I did, it's too late. Um, so what happens? when we're trying to understand this word aright. Well, the first thing we want to note, and it is noteworthy, taking one verse out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23 and verse 6 says, In his days Judah shall be saved, Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That is one of the names of the many names of God, one of the names by which God revealed himself. You've got the name appearing many times, not just in Jeremiah 23, 6. I believe it will also appear in Ezekiel um, and, I'm sorry, in Zechariah um, as a pointing to a, an event in the future, Christ's return. So, why am I telling you this? Because the first thing we have to understand, even though I'm using the Lord, our righteousness, and you might say, well, you're talking about sanctification, though. Right. It all comes from Him. So if I'm using this term, I don't think that I'm confusing the two. I'm trying to show you these qualities, these attributes, they come from Him. We cannot have them. Just as the Lord, our righteousness, He is our righteousness, He is also our set her apart or our sanctifiers and that brings me to a new testament concept which is when jesus prayed that he said he must go away otherwise the holy spirit could not come or would not come and we've got the same kind of it is by this vehicle it is by this person of the godhead so I don't want to make the mistake of limiting this setting apart, this holiness, or this sanctification. I'm using the words that we use commonly as something that we ourselves are going to do. And I said there are three or four scriptures where people have hit the wall because it says, you sanctify yourself. You sanctify the Lord Jesus in your heart. And I'll, I'll get to those because those are important to understand, but the real reality is, just like the Lord, our righteousness, if righteousness comes from him and he's our righteousifier, he's also the one who sanctifies. It is commonly in the New Testament through the vehicle of the person of the Holy Spirit. And that is where I begin to kind of put this message together. All this was introduction for terms of understanding, but when we start looking at the holiness of God, it should not be that we understand or look at the word holiness of God and try to somehow build our own Tower of Babel to get there. The holiness of God is the holiness of God, and we as a people, until we have come to the knowledge of Christ and faith in Christ and look to Calvary and the shed blood of Christ, we are in the state that is still, we'll call it uncleansed, not, we're made clean through the word of God. That's what John 15 tells me. And we know that through the word, Jesus, we're made whole. So I have at least a starting point on when the Bible is, specifically the New Testament, is referring to the sanctification of the believer. In fact, um, there is reference, I'll see if I can, if the brain is still functioning real good uh, after all this time of talking to you. 
Uh, here, to give you an idea, this one refers to the Spirit uh, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter uh, 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied through sanctification of the Spirit. So Peter's understanding, at least in this opening portion here, is the agency or the vehicle by which this happens, the Holy Spirit. This, I'm going to do it, this opens up a whole question. Remember those believers in the New Testament when they were asked if they had received the Holy Spirit and they said they hadn't even heard of such a thing. Remember that? Well, that tells you right there that these folks, they obviously responded to the gospel. They responded to somebody's preaching. Somewhere, somebody preached to them. They came to the faith, but they hadn't yet come to an understanding or a full understanding. There was no printed book, so they didn't have the ability to go chapter and verse, and let's quote that. And it was, it's seen as two separate events. Now, there are, even within the Protestant framework, there are several, we'll call them at least five major views on sanctification. And they're pretty scary. And why they're pretty scary is because some push the, the envelope towards, um, some of them are incredibly Arminian in their understanding. Some are completely Calvinistic in their understanding. And somewhere in the middle, you find that um, there has to be this almost, it's like a, a place for the thread to go through the hole of the needle. If you're going to stay on either one of these sides, you get blocked in by theological checkboxes that, unfortunately, once you establish your doctrine and your theology, you can't get out of. So uh, I don't want anybody here today listening to me to leave here with some old, faulty understanding of the concepts we're dealing with. Remember, I said at the beginning, it, it would really do us well to start with one principle. God is holy, and everything that is not of God, in this case, for our understanding of this word, is not holy. And there are people who have been indeed set apart called and set apart. This is the reference to Jesus calling the body of believers the church. Ephesians talks about God calling out from among those that he didn't call or choose. Exalexitos is the Greek word. So it's very clear that there is the event, we'll call it, if we're going to try and line this up properly, there is the event of what we'll call prevenient grace. Um, the hound of heaven, or God's searching, um, scouring, if you will, and finds me. Preveniently, I had no idea that God was even working in my life, right? That's prevenient grace. He was acting before I even knew him. Then I begin to study, I begin to learn, I begin to understand. Suddenly, it hits me, and I have come to the faith. I've been hearing the word of God. I've come to the faith. I have been put in right standing with God. And not to make it like here's one event and then here's another event. They're pretty close to each other. But they're not one event. They're not homogenized as one. Is the process that begins. God sets apart the individual. I can still go, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I had the choice. No. I don't think I can stand here and be this tough guy, you know? So I don't want to do this anymore. I have a choice. You have a choice. You could say, yeah, this, this, this Christian walk is too difficult. Besides, you know, my, my wife or my girlfriend, she doesn't like me tithing anyway, so, you know, a convenient excuse to bail, right? You, you can still and I can still say no. At the same time, this setting apart, people tend to think that the setting apart is like, now I, now I belong to God, and I, don't, I do not 
have a life, which then makes people think that sanctification and holiness bring about um, isolation and um, you're, you're in this miserable container over here. No, it simply means that God's going to use you for something. This is, to me, this is the simplest way of looking at this. God is going to use you for something. It may not be for the same thing as that person over there or as me. God's going to use you for something. Whatever that something is that he's going to use you for is for his purpose. And therefore, you, you, and in that moment, you've become set apart. It's like somebody who says, well, I'm no saint. Oh, I go to the church. I'm, I'm a believer, but I'm no saint. Well, then you don't understand what the Bible says. The Bible says you're a saint because you're a believer, because you're a faither. You're a saint. You are set apart. A saint is not what some other churches have defined it as, either a bunch of dead people that get recognized after they die, <laughs> or you're just so darn good and you never do anything bad, so you're a saint. It's not what that means. Simply put, because that word saint is going to fall in the same category uh, of Greek words, of Hebrew words, let's go back and let me touch on an example I already gave of holiness that the priesthood, that the Aaronic or Aaron's line was supposed to have, the holiness of the priest. And let me ask you this. What about the sons of Aaron? What about those? Were they holy? Were they perfect? Yeah, that's right. no, I don't think so. Right? Nadab and Abihu. And they be no more. That's pretty holy right there. My point is that once we understand a little bit better what this activity is. And let's just use this word sanctification. We've got, we've got it as a verb. We have sanctify, sanctification, um, holiness. All of these words can be in uh, ad adjectival form, noun, and verb. And as we encounter them, they may be describing, I'm going to try and wrap this up right now because I can't go any further. They may be describing a state of being, a state of being Hear me out, a state of being holy, which is not a state of being good or perfect, but a state of being set apart. Once we get that, we get all this be perfect and don't send garbage out of the way. And if we're going to talk about those people that God has set apart, don't you think God knows that we don't have the ability to be perfect? When the King James translators were translating, many times it'll say, be perfect, be ye holy. Let's take a look exactly how the original language reads, because my, my instinct is with all of these things, you're going to find that it's not really saying or driving that point. And it may be driving a point that's even greater, which is those who are faithing, the faithing ones, the ones who are trusting God. Um, these who say, I'm a saint, I'm set apart, doesn't mean I'm perfect. I've got to include in that, that when I'm looking at this to understand what, it, what is it, it is not a state of morality. Now, 99% of, and I've got books and printouts, 99% of what I looked at towards the end of my studies was all about good morals, morality. God is not interested in, I'm sorry, if, if you're going to go down that pathway, then define for me what it means to be good morally. Define what that means, to be good morally. Does that mean that you don't do certain things, but you do other things? Because in that veil of good morality, essentially most of the theologians and scholars who wrote these things are negating one verse of scripture that cannot ever be left out of the equation. And that is Romans 3.23. If all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it means it is impossible to put the term holiness or sanctification upon an individual and make it connote that that individual has become morally good of themselves, 
or even if it was of God, that's not the meaning of it. We'll find, especially through 1 Peter, the example I just gave, is something that the third person of the Godhead is going to be doing in the believer. And that is not something that will be done against your will, but something that because we are faithing, this operation occurs. That brings about the next group of people who will say, well, then isn't this a process? Isn't the sanctification of the individual ongoing? Well, then again, we've got to go back to define the term. Because if the term is going to be understood as set apart, are you, let's go there, are, are we being continually set apart? Or did God set you apart one time? This is not once saved, always saved. Don't confuse this. Did God say, I want you, and then the next day, because you know, he doesn't remember, he's got a lot of things to, and then he says, I want you, tomorrow, he's, he tell, he's telling Louis again, because Louis, I, I know that you have a good memory, but God maybe forgot, so he's going to tell you again tomorrow, I want you, and then again the next day, do you think that God does it that way? I don't think so. So I'm being ludicrous to make the point to just kind of put this to bed already. So we can at least know when we start this discussion and we start studying the word, we will be clear when people talk about this that it is not going to be reflecting perfection. It is never going to be reflecting somebody's sinlessness. We may be given the help. Um, Paul spells this out really plainly. He says, once we have become fathers. He doesn't say this, I'm saying it like this. A battle begins, a war is waged inside the individual um, that is essentially the spirit and the flesh going at it. Now, for the individual that says, I'm called of God, it's a true statement, I'm called of God, God called me, I didn't call myself, he called me. That means that now I see, I'm faithing, I'm, I've now been, I'm set apart. Those descriptions I've just gave may be absolutely true. What wouldn't be true would be a false statement, would be to say that because God has done this, I am now in this frozen section of the believers. I don't move, right? It's not happening like that. So um, I'm hoping that this foundation of the words will help us um, to go into a study of certain passages which I think even for me I've grappled with until I, I've kind of pulled these apart. I will review these words as we go into translating a few verses so that we can see and reflect on what it is exactly um, that I'm, I'm trying to steer away from. And for those people who are stuck in uh, what I've called bad or old theology, um, and, and theology, the Word of God should never change. It doesn't. It's people who have, you know, suddenly they have this thing in their mind and it's like, wow, this, this must mean that. Well, if it's confirmed, as I've said, that's how you make sound doctrine. I don't read anywhere that any of the individuals, I mentioned Peter, but go to the Old Testament, let's talk about Samson. Was Samson perfect? He had good hair, that's about it, right? <laughs> and he loved the ladies. But Samson and God had called him, had chosen him, not perfect. Look at David. I mean, as you go along, you realize that it would be impossible to have all of these people who reflect, find yourself on these pages, if they all were chosen and then they just, they just floated on clouds all day because that's how some people come into the church saying, well, that's, that's what you're supposed to be instead of what we are, which is sinners being saved by grace. And we learn a little bit more each day as we go through the trials of life, how much the Lord Jesus Christ loves us, and how much he puts up with us, and how much he has suffered because of my sins and because of yours. And the beauty is I happen to know from my Bible that my sins, past, present, future, have been covered. As long as I stay connected in the faith and I'm looking unto him, and the idea of being perfected now, no. But the idea of being in his presence and being perfect 
in his presence? Yes. So when we talk about this, you indeed could say it is, ultimately it is a process, but to define it aright and to look at each of these verses and understand that um, when people talk about this operation of God, it is not to make you into some freak that's, you know, some person that you'd say, oh, that, that's a wacky religious person. It is establishing something that God said, you're mine, you belong to me. Now that may be offensive to some people, but if you are bought with his blood, scripture says you're bought with the price, that's his shed blood, then he has the right to say, hey, you over there, and he's going to call your name specifically. He's going to say, hey, Louis, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the guy next to you or the guy next to you over there. I'm talking to you. That's how God's going to talk. If he's going to say anything and if it's an urging that's placed on the heart, it'll be just like that. That is clarity to me. And I can tell you the clarity that I've laid out just from the word study alone removes this idea somehow that for many years, Somebody like me who would read and I'd encounter these passages and I'd say, well, how can I do that? If God is the righteousifier, if God is the one doing the choosing who is the sanctifier, the setting apart one, how could there be anything that I could bring to the table except for this? I'm trusting him. I'm faithing in him. And the rest of it becomes really quite clear when we see it through the lens of the words properly and rightly uh, define. So I hope next week that's what we will tackle. And I'm looking forward to tackling at least three or four passages which I find people normally kind of stumble upon, don't know what to do with. Once you see the word and the way it is intended to be understood, clarity comes. And the reality is it's something that should make you real happy because God's not asking you to be something that you can never be. He is not asking you to act a certain way and imitate and be this fake thing. He's looking for, as I said many times, authentic, the authentic you. And the authentic you starts with you being chosen by God, God working in you, and the, the, the you that was intended, not the you that, that lived before, but the you that was intended starts to come out by way of the Holy Spirit. That radiating beauty that apart from that we do not have is the beginning of understanding what God sets apart, he cares for, he knows our frame, and he is not expecting you or me to be something, as I said, that we can never be. Otherwise, you just walk around frustrated like, I, I'm not that, I could never be that. That's right. But God says, I still chose you, and I set you apart for my purpose. Now, maybe for some of us the purpose is not clear, but hang on. Maybe the purpose will become more clear as we study the word. For right now, that's my message. Hopefully you'll be here next week. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www dot pastor melissa scott dot com